Hello, this is Anthony with day 11, uh, chapter 11 from Heal the Sick with Brother T. Osborne. And this chapter is Basis for Steadfast Trust. And so let's get started. A man came to me asking that we pray for him to be healed. He's, he had been deaf in one ear for over 20 years. He seemed to be very uncertain regarding his healing because, as he put it, I've been prayed for by the greatest people of trust in our country during the last 20 years and I have never received help. Then he asked, why cannot, why cannot my ear be healed? It can, I replied, if you will believe. But they have all told me that, he said, and I have never received help from any of them. My friend, I interrupted, do you think God is willing to heal a fellow like you? I don't know, he answered, then added, I know that if it was, it is his will to do it, he is able, but well, I guess that's just one of those things we aren't supposed to know. I said, that is why you will never be healed. You have never read the word of God for yourself, nor have you received the trust that has been taught to you. You do not know whether or not God has said he would heal you. Therefore, do, you do not know whether or not it is his will to heal you. I asked him, do you believe it's God's will to keep his promise? Of course, he replied. Well, I say, I said, he has promised to heal you. And if I can quote you his promise, then you should believe him and be healed right here, right now. God included you. I quoted a few scriptures regarding healing of our bodies, which are applicable to everyone individually, such as I'm the Lord who heals you. I, I, I which uh, it would it. <laughs> it was spoken to over 3 million people. Yeah, there's some errors here, so you kind of have to figure out some of the sentences sometimes. By whose stripes you were healed, and is, all, is any sick among you? Let that person call. Then I ask, now in the face of all these scriptures, which are statements made to all who will believe them, do you think God included you? Yes, he said. I guess he did. Well then, I asked, is God willing to heal you, seeing that he has made provision for the healing of every sickness and every disease amongst the people? Among all the people? Yes, he said very firmly. I do believe healing is for me tonight. I have never seen it be like this before. There seemed to be a glitter of trust in his eye when he saw that God's word was for him personally. I knew the circumstances were right. For prayer on his behalf, I could hardly touch his deaf ear before sound burst into it, and he could hear me as well as that uh, well with that ear as with the other. When at last he knew that God had said what God had said regarding all sickness and disability, and dared to step out on that word, declaring himself to be included in the any of James five fourteen, the you of Exodus fifteen twenty six, and the our of Matthew eight seventeen. Then what God's word had said was accomplished in him and he was healed. We've had many times where people come to us and they say, oh, I've had this person pray for me. I had this person pray for me. All these major ministries from the United States and Europe and everything. And it's never worked. I've never been healed. And so what I've learned from Brother T.L. Osborne is you start asking questions, right? And as you're asking questions, God begins to reveal to you what's the actual problem. And when you identify the problem, it's very easy to to answer the problem with scripture. So as a friend of mine does in Australia, is if they don't get healed right away after praying, he starts quoting scripture to them. Why? Because scripture is alive. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, right? So it's it's instilling in them the trust in God as they hear his word, they hear his promises, and it begins to impact them like never before. And then they begin to understand, oh my God, like this is for me. And then the next time we pray for them, they're completely healed if they're not healed before that. That, that illustrates so well the purpose for which this book is written, that you may see that the promises in God's word are for you, and that realizing this, you will act upon God's word and expect him to make good in your life. What trust is? Now, trust is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. This is, the, some, this is sometimes quoted, trust is the title deed for things you have hoped for and the putting to proof, proof of things unseen. And so I don't agree with this translation, um, even with this definition of trust. Um, that's why I, I lean towards more Romans 4.21, that it was 
that Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised because that actually shows more of a definition of what trust is, especially in God, that it's complete trust and being fully convinced, not moved, unshakable, right? Not only that, but the word hope in, in King James time, if you look at the etymology of the word hope, it actually means expectation. So if we were to read this, it says, now trust is the substance of things expected for and the evidence of things not seen. So that would make a lot more sense, right? And so in continuing, it says, or trust is the title deed to the property you now you know you possess, even though you have not seen it. So just to make it more practical, I would say Amazon, right? You go on Amazon, you look at the different products, you decide you're going to buy something, you click and you buy it. It says that you purchased it. They took the money from your account, but you don't have it in your hand, but you know that it's on the way. And so it's the exact same thing that by trust, you know that the package is on its way. So it's the same way faith or trust works, right? One of the most helpful and enlightening expressions of, of trust is this. Trust is expecting God to do what you, what you know he has said in his word that he will do. Doesn't that sound like Romans 4.21? Trust is believing that God speaks the truth. Hmm. Fully convinced, right? God has never asked that we exercise trust for something that he has not first promised to do for us, right? Because if it hasn't even entered into our mind, it entered into our heart by his word, then how can we believe him for something that he's never even spoken before or even said, right? So when we begin to see it for what it is, and it makes perfect sense that God reveals his promise and then as he reveals his promise, then it opens the door for us to believe and act upon it. And then it becomes our, our reality, plain and simple. God, um, let's continue. One writer said, God deals with his children like this. First, he gives us a promise. And then the promise creates trust, which produces action. He fulfills it. Always remember, God never asks us to believe he will do something for us unless he has promised to do it. Because of this fact, Paul has stated, trust comes by hearing the word of God. How could trust possibly come any other way? How am I to know that a millionaire will make it, me a gift of a thousand dollars unless he says that he will do it? His ability to do it would not prove his willingness. I must have his promise before I can expect such a gift from him. The only way for your daughter to know that she will receive a new dress tomorrow is for you to promise it to her. She believes that you will not fail to keep your word, yet there is a possibility that you, you could die before tomorrow or that you may not have been honest with her, but not so with the Lord. Balaam, the true prophet of the Lord, said, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall he not make good on it? And that's Numbers twenty three nineteen. Christ the Healer. F.F. F. Bosworth, who wrote one of the most outstanding books ever to be published on the subject of divine healing, begins with these words. Before you have a steadfast trust for healing of the body, you must rid, uh, be rid of all uncertainty concerning God's will in the matter. Appropriating trust cannot go beyond the knowledge of the revealed will of God. And this is so true. You have to go back to his word and see what he says. Not people's opinions, not people's experiences. Those lie. Those aren't the sum of all the wisdom of the world, okay? Because people go to a restaurant. They have a bad experience. Doesn't mean they stop going to the restaurant. Do they do research now before they go to a restaurant, right? So you can see that just because somebody has an experience doesn't mean anything, Unless we can back it up fully with the word of God. Before attempting to exercise trust for healing, you need to know that what the scriptures plainly teach. That it is just as much God's will to heal the body as it is his will to heal the spirit. It is only by knowing that God promises what you are seeking that all uncertainty can be removed and a steadfast trust can be possible. His promises are each a revelation of what God is eager to do for us because it's his idea. It's not our idea. It's his idea and he's making it known because he wants to give it to us. But it requires for us to grab hold of the promise so that he can do it all here on the earth. Plain and simple. Until we know what God's will is, there's nothing on which to base our trust. Smith, uh, Dr. <laughs> Mr. Bosworth <laughs> then goes to say, Jesus said, the word is the seed. It is the seed of divine life until you are sure from God's word that it is his will to heal you. 
you are trying to reap a harvest where no seed has been planted. It, it would be impossible for a farmer to have trust for a harvest before seed was planted, right? You have to put the seed into the ground and then you expect the harvest even though you don't see it growing or what's coming, what's going on below the dirt. And then as it begins to grow and mature and sprout, you know, and you have the expectation of the harvest. And this is why I believe Jesus is using the parable of the seed in Mark chapter four. So God is faithful. It is not God's will that there be a harvest without the planting of seed, without his will being known and acted upon. Jesus said, you, sh you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Freedom from sickness comes from knowing the truth. God does not does nothing without his word, right? He speaks it forth and it doesn't return to him void. It goes and accomplishes what he sends it, right? He sent his word and he healed, he healed them are the words of the Holy Spirit. All his work is done in faithfulness to his promises. If you are sick, knowledge that it is God's will to heal in, is the seed, which is to be planted in your mind and heart. It is not planted, if it's not planted there, and, um, and it is not planted there until it is known and received and trusted. So you have to resolve in yourself to trust it. You cannot become a Christian until you know that it is God's will to save you. It is the word of God planted and watered and steadfastly trusted, which heals both spirit and body. The seed must remain planted and be kept watered before it can produce the harvest. Plain and simple. Able and willing. For you, for you to say, I believe the Lord is able to heal me before you know that God's well, from God's word that he is willing to heal you is like a farmer saying, I believe God is able to give me a harvest without any seed being planted and watered. That makes a lot of sense, right? God cannot regenerate your spirit before you know his will in the matter because salvation is by trust. That is by trusting the known will of God being healed is being saved in a physical sense. Praying for, uh, praying for healing with the, the trust the destroying words, if it be your will, is not planting the seed. It is destroying the seed. The prayer of trust, which leads, which heals the sick, is to follow, not proceed, the planting of the seed, the word upon which trust is based. This is the gospel which the Holy Spirit says is the power of God unto salvation. In all its phases, both physical and spiritual, all the gospel is for every creature and for all nations. The gospel does not leave a person in uncertainty praying if it be your will. It tells you what God's will is. The Holy Spirit's words himself bore our sick, the Holy Spirit um, words himself bore our sicknesses are just as true as part of the gospel as his, as his words. Who his self, own self bore our sins on in his body on the tree. Neither the spiritual nor the physical phase of the, of the gospel is to be applied by prayer alone. Seed is powerless unless it is planted. Indeed, instead of saying, pray for me, many should say, teach me God's words so that I can intelligently cooperate with him for my recovery. And this is a very good point. We must know what the benefits of redemption are before we can appropriate them in trust. Purpose to be whole. David specifically the uh, specified <laughs> who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases after being sufficiently enlightened. Our attitude towards sickness should be the same as our attitude towards sin. Our purpose, our purpose to have our body healed should be as definite as our, our purpose to have our spirit healed. We should not ignore any part of the gospel. Our substitute Jesus bore both our sins and our sicknesses that we might be delivered from them. Christ bearing of our sins and sicknesses is surely a valid reason for trusting him now for deliverance from both. And this is why I go over Isaiah 53 and show that what he did for sicknesses and diseases, he also did for sin. The, the same words are used um, as far as saying bore and carried are the exact same Hebrew words used for bore and carried sin as they are for healing or for for a sickness so that we are healed by his stripes right so when you go back and you study that slowly you begin to see the whole picture and that it was all part of god's plan even before jesus came on the earth right so just to say that and so Christ bearing of our sins and sickness is surely a valid reason for trusting him now to del for deliverance from both 
When in prayer, we de definitely commit to God the forgiveness of our sins. We are to believe on the authority of his word that our, that our prayer is heard. We are to do the same when praying for healing. Attend to my, my words. Decline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and, and health to all their flesh. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. In this comprehensive passage, God tells us exactly how to attend to his words. He says, let them not depart from your eyes. Instead of having your eyes on the symptoms and being occupied with them, let not God's word depart from your eyes. That is, look at them continually. And like Abraham, be strong in trust by looking at, at the promises of God and nothing else. So when we go back and we read Romans chapter 4, and we look at Abraham, it says that he didn't weaken in trust. And instead... He hoped against hope. Remember I said what hope actually means is expectation. So he had an expectation against the expected, what would naturally be expected, right? So this is what makes the verse make sense because he was old in age and what to be ex was to be normally expected is that he couldn't have children, but he was expect he had an expectation against the, uh, the normal expectation or the expected, right? And he was able to bear a son by the promise that God had made him. So imagine how long did Abraham wait for this promise? How long did he trust in God's word? Because it says he was never weakened in trust. And instead he encouraged himself, right? And so we can see how did he encourage himself? He was ever putting the promise of God before him. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you that you're going to give me a son. God, you said you're going to give me a son. I thank you that you're, you're a man of your word. You're a God of your word. You don't lie, right? So he's constantly doing this and he's stirring himself up to increase in trust, right? Instead of, oh, I'm older now. I don't know if it's possible. Sarah's older now. It, 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 did God really mean what he said? Right, all of these lies and, and doubts and everything else could could naturally sneak in, but that's not the case with Abraham. It says that he grew in in trust. So let's continue. God, uh, good seeds grows. When we attend to God's word by not letting them depart from our eyes and by keeping them in the middle of our hearts, the seed is in good ground. The kind of ground in which Jesus says it brings forth fruit, and where Paul says it works effectively. When the farmer puts seed into the ground, he does not dig it up every day to see how it's doing. He believes that the seed is, has begun its work. Why not have the same trust in the imperishable seed, Christ's word, which he says are spirit and life and believe that they are already doing their work without waiting for visual evidence. When your eyes are on the symptoms and your mind is occupied with them more than God's word, you have planted the wrong kind of seed for the harvest that you desire. You have in your mind seeds of doubt you are trying to raise one kind of crop from another kind of seed it is impossible to sow tares and reap wheat your symptoms may point you to death but god's word points you to life and you cannot look in these in these opposite directions at the same time after you plant seed you believe that it is growing even before you see it this is trust which is the evidence of of things not seen in christ we have a perfect evidence for trust any person can get rid of their doubts by looking steadfastly and only at the evidence which God has given for our trust, saying only what God says will produce an increased trust. This will make it easier to believe than to doubt. The evidences for trust are much stronger than those for doubting. Don't doubt your trust. Doubt your doubts. They are, un are unreliable. God is waiting on you. A lady said to me, Mr. Osborne, I would give anything for my, for, uh, to have my mother healed. I know God is able to completely restore her, and I believe I have the trust that God would heal her if I only knew that it was his will to do so. I asked her, do you believe it is God's will to save a sinner? Oh, yes, she replied. How do you know? I asked. Well, she said, if no other reason, the golden text of the Bible, John three sixteen, proves that for it says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. She was willing to believe that God would save the vilest sinner because she could quote one Bible verse, which promised that uh, what she believed. I asked her, do you not believe it is God's will to heal your mother? Well, I do not know that that we can tell, was her reply. Will God keep his promise? I asked her. Yes, of course he will, he said. Well, I answered, the same Bible that invites whoever to be healed of sin also invites 
any to be healed of sickness. And I continued, the same Christ who always forgave sins, always healed sicknesses. It was the same deliverer who, who said, arise, take up your bed and walk, who said, son, of, uh, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. I continued, the same scripture that says, who forgives all your iniquities, also says, who heals all your diseases. The same scripture that says, who his own self bore our sins on in his body, also says, by whose stripes you were healed. Christ came to rid us of sickness as well as sin. He took our sicknesses as well as our sins. He redeemed us from one, the same as from the other. I told the woman, both sin and sickness are hateful in God's sight. Jesus Christ always defeated both while here on earth. He still wants to do the same. If you can be so sure that God is willing to save the sinner, then you can be just as sure that he's willing to heal your mother who is sick. So we, we find that this is a question that's constantly coming up in the church is because people don't know the will of God on the subject. But as you go back and you look at scripture and you question and you ask questions that are just simply logical, God gave you a mind and rationale for a reason so you can use it and say, okay, if it says this, then th is this what it means? If it is what it means, when it's God's word and it's his, his will revealed, then we are to grab hold of it and stand on it and not be moved from it no matter what we see. For instance, one of the first guys I prayed for, I went to him, his his leg was, was completely black. He was going to die um, because he had the gastric bypass surgery. He was in a coma, prayed, he came out of the coma. He, he wasn't moving his leg. It turned completely black and they were threatening to chop it off. So I went and I prayed for him. Went back three days later. He saw the doctor again. The doctor was spitting fear into his mind and he was believing the fear. He's like, brother, please pray for him. Please pray for him. So every three days, this was the cycle for about a month or so. But as, as every time I went to see him, his leg was becoming lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter until he was completely healed. He was not just healed in his leg, he was healed of diabetes, he was healed of high blood sugar and high cholesterol and all these other things I didn't even pray for. I was just praying for his leg. That's all I was doing, right? And when you see that it's God's will to heal and you become fully convinced that it's will to heal, then it instills in you perseverance to grab hold of God's word and not be shaken and not be moved. And this is where we have to get. Because what happens is people that have an experience say, well, I prayed and nothing happened. Well, okay. How many times did you, did you say a sinner's prayer before you actually believed? Hmm. Yeah. You want to go there? We can go there too. Because it's not until you're fully convinced yourself that you've become a believer and you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that you become saved. That's according to scripture, Right. So it's the same thing with healing. It's not until you're fully convinced that God is going to do what he promised and he promised healing, that he heals all disease. It's, he's, his nature is healer 100% that when you pray, even if you pray for yourself, you're fully trusting in God's nature. You're not trusting in your ability to pray or your ability to hold on and, and interpret scripture. You're completely relying on him who is the author and the finisher of your trust. And this is what we need to get back to. Faith within reach. Trust within reach. The woman had, was amazed and thrilled beyond measure at the simplicity of the word of God and was very happy to discover that Christ is healer for all, just as he is savior for all. Trust is only believing that God will do what he said in his word that he would do. This fact places trust within the reach of the simplest child. And I've seen children pray for the sick and them get healed instantly. Right? Because they understand, hey, the Bible says I can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And then they do so because they believe in Jesus and they see the evidence of it on a regular basis. When once we concluded that the written word is God's revealed will to us for everything that he longs to do for us, then we will treasure that word and stand upon it, fully expecting God to make, make it good without wavering, doubting or worrying. Right? And so... I mean, that's simply put, you just got to stand on it, right? And so God 
He makes everything simple. His word is simple. Religion takes that and makes it complicated. Oh, it's because of this or because of that. Blah, 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 Right? And it's not the case. It's simply trusting God and believing him, period. That's it. Don't worry about anything else. Healing from heaven. Lillian B. Yeomans, MD, medical doctor, begins chapter two of her wonderful book, Healing from Heaven, with these words. I believe that one of the greatest hindrance to healing is the absence of certain definite knowledge as to God's will. There is lurking in most everyone who has not properly studied God's word, a feeling that God may not be willing that he, that we have to persuade him to heal us, which is funny because he's more invested in your healing than we are. People often say, I know that God is able. He has the power to heal me if he only will. Like the leper in the eighth chapter of Matthew, who said to Jesus, if you, if you will, you can make me clean. Many of us have been taught to pray. If it is your will, if it be your will, heal me. That wasn't the way David prayed. He cried Psalms 6 2. Have mercy on, mer mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Then he added in the ninth verse, The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. There are no ifs or buts in David's prayer. The prophet Jer Jeremiah, too, had no doubt about God's will as to healing, for he cried, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. And again, we find the connection here between healing and saving um, that most people don't see. And we... God's people of this day should be free from doubt regarding our Father's will for our bodies, for it is as clearly revealed in the Word as His will concerning our spiritual salvation. His work is not in vain. In a sense, the whole Bible is a revelation not only of God's willingness to heal our spiritual ailments, but our physical ones also. One of His covenants, covenant names is Jehovah Rapha, which means God who heals. And He also, and He is also the changeless healing health, bestowing life-giving Lord, undisputed sovereign over all the powers of the universe. Jesus is the exact image of the Father, the perfect expression of God in his holy will. This is Hebrews 1.3. He could say, you who have seen me have seen my Father also. And he declared that his works were not his own, but the, the Father's that sent him. He healed all who came to him, never refusing a single individual. You don't find that anywhere in Scripture. He never says, no, today's not your day. No, God is teaching you a lesson. You never find that in one instance in the Gospels. So you cannot say with any certainty that this was God's will by saying that. No. That is actually going against what God's will is and is, that is manifested through Jesus because he healed everyone. And this is, again, is in our manual, God is healer. We take you through that so you can see for yourselves. You cannot find a case where he said, it is not my will to heal you. And it is not. It is necessary for you to suffer for disciplinary purposes. His answer was always, I will. And this fact settles forever what God's will is regarding to sickness and health. Now, even going back to the leper, he removed the doubt by saying, I will. So he didn't say, okay, here are the conditions. No, no. He addressed the uncertainty and said, I will. And then he laid his hand on the leper and the leper was healed. Salvation includes physical healing. The word salvation, if properly understood, shows beyond a shadow of doubt that healing for the body is always the will of God for any and all who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Webster tells us that salvation is deliverance from sin and sin's penalty. A prominent part of the penalty is sickness. We can see that in Deuteronomy 28. The word saved in Greek is sozo, which when properly translated carries the meaning of physical and spiritual healing. It is the same word Jesus used when he said to the leper, your trust has made you whole. It is the same word used in Luke 8, 36. He that was possessed of devils was healed. The word salvation is an, an all-inclusive word, which means full deliverance, complete safety, preservation, and soundness, spiritually, mentally, physically, with a miracle salvation from sin and from sickness. Salvation is healing. Dr. John G. Lake, a great missionary evangelist in South Africa at the turn of the 20th century, had a ministry which resulted in healing of thousands. In an article entitled The Dominion of a Christian under the subheading 
the subhead of divine healing, not something separate from salvation, Dr. Lake writes these words. One of the difficulties concerning healing that God has to remove from the human mind is the wretched thing that often prevails in the best of Christian circles, where which healing is taught in practice. The idea that divine healing is something disassociated or separate from Christ's salvation. It is not. I see I have I didn't even know this, okay? So going back and looking what, what Lake is saying lines up perfectly with what I found myself studying through scripture. That the word salvation or sozo to be saved in in Greek it's solitero for salvation, they only take save. They don't take rescue or to be made whole, to holize. Right? So what God actually does is he makes you whole, and I have a whole teaching and everything on this. It's amazing. You have to go through it. It just takes it step by step and shows you exactly what scripture says. So let's continue. Healing is, is simply the salvation of Jesus Christ having its divine action in one's body, the same as it had its divine action in one's spirit. When Christ healed the body, he healed the spirit also. All a man needs to do is receive the Lord by trust. Doing this, one's defective eyes receive sight. The dormant mind becomes active. The sick body is healed. Dr. Lake f further uh, wrote further. I want to fix this thought in your minds. The healing of an individual is God's demonstration to the soul that their sins have been forgiven. So James states, after affirming that the prayer of trust shall save the sick, that if the sick person has committed sins, they shall be forgiven. If if only the victim of sin and sickness who has come to Jesus for deliverance will have trust enough to believe it, he or she will be free in body, free in spirit, healed within, healed without, and the word of God is written so that we can understand and be sure what the will of God is. And it's so amazing and it's so simple. Our enjoyable freedom from Genesis to Revelation is especially emphasizes one thing that the will of God is to free the body, mind and spirit from sin and the effects or penalties, penalty of sin, which are disease and death. When the will of God is complete in the human race, sin, sickness and death will have disappeared. Right. And we can see that with the promise of Revelation and, and many things that are stated in the New Testament. We don't have time to get into that, but it, it completely shows everything of, of sin, sickness and death being cast off the earth. OK, the beginning of immort immortality is when God breathes his life into you and me and our spirits become the recipients of eternal life in Jesus Christ. How simple it should be for people who have this confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation to add trust for the body as well as for the spirit. It works identically the same for sickness as for sin. Had this truth been preached, the sickness question would have vanished once and for all when the sin question was taken care of. One of the most enjoyable freedoms in the world is the mental and spiritual freedom that comes from the escape from the bondage of fear. The fear of sickness that need never be tolerated by the redeemed, recreated and delivered, uh, delivered uh, and a delivered child of Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, the great physician and, and healer. It might be thought that this truth has been somewhat overemphasize. But if you could stand by our sides as we proclaim these truths and hear the warnings, beware of false prophets who will deceive you in miracles. It may be, it may not be the Father's will to heal you. Sickness is often divine blessing. Healing is not for, for today and so forth. Then you would understand why we underscore the fact that according to God's word, it is always his will to heal those who obey, who obey him, believe him and act boldly on his word. And actually, what happens is people where they attack us and they say, well, see, look, uh, beware of the false prophets. They themselves are proving themselves to be false prophets, false messengers, because they're saying things that go directly against God's word and how God heals 100 percent of the time that he is healer, that that that's his nature, that's his character. And to say anything else against that is utter blasphemy. You're lying against the character and nature of God. And that's what the devil does. And that's what the Pharisees did to Jesus, 
right? So when we go back to the word and we can see it clearly laid out in his word, we can't be moved from that. We have to stand on his word and say, look, this is his nature. This is what he's provided. This is the gospel. This is the good news that what he did for sin, he also did for sickness and he did both the same. And they're constantly seen together. The remedy for sin and sickness are constantly seen together throughout the passages from, from Psalms 103 to Jeremiah to Isaiah 53 to uh, Matthew 8 and so on and so forth. And we can see over and over and over exactly what Jesus accomplished. And it's so much greater and so more, much more in depth and so much more simple than we've ever made it because we've refused to go back and look at scripture. We've missed it because we can't believe that it's so simple that we have to make it complicated so that we can think that we understand. But we're just professing to be wise in our own eyes, but we prove ourselves to be foolish before God because God's saying, look, I made this simple. I made it simple. Just believe the simple. Have the trust of a child. Take hold of the simple and it will become your reality. Amen. Well, let me bless you. Let me pray for you. Just lay your hands on yourself. So right now in Jesus name, Father, I thank you for all sickness, all disease, all pain. You go 100%. You go now, once and for all. This is a child of God. This is a child of of Jehovah Rapha. And he abides in them and they abide in him. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen.